right then. Got a lot of wood. Oh, you've arrived. Wait. Shoot, you're not one of ours. Look, I've been mining this wood all afternoon. If you want to take it, you're going to be extremely unpopular. No one's going to like you. I don't care how big your gun turrets are. Nobody likes a pushy mech. Nobody. You want, you want this wood? Fine. I'm just, I'm going to go home. But you're going to hear about this. Everyone's going to hear about this, okay? I'm out. Hello everyone, I'm Never Die. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at size expansion, invaders from afar, as well as looking at how fun it is to play the solo campaign with the automata. The new version of Scythe allows you to play with up to seven people. It introduces two new races, the purple and the greens. They are pretty cool. They both start on the main landmass, which means they don't have to cross the river like everybody else. Does that give them a huge advantage? No, not really. Uh, you can still pen them in if you can get your mines quickly and then jump onto their mine spot because they do need to cross through a mine to get out of their area. And I've played a game where I got penned in right away, uh, more so than people with mines because I didn't think I needed to build one, so I got stuck. Uh, they do introduce traps and little flags. You get four of these per player, uh, depending on which faction you pick. Flags can be laid down and then with one of your mech abilities you can rally your troops to them and just teleport to the little flags everywhere. They basically act like new tunnels for just the green player. The purple player gets to set mines here and there. The mines, there's four of them, you randomly place one because on the back there's a random penalty which you don't even know. Your opponent also doesn't know. When your opponent steps on it, they trigger the trap and suffer the consequences. You can then later rearm it if you want. That introduces a little bit of unknown. If you're jumping into a battle, maybe it'll destroy the battle for you. Who knows? So, actually it's not too much different. The, a lot of expansions do introduce a lot of new mechanics, new ways of playing the game, and you gotta read a bit of a rule book. This expansion has about a four-page manual. And it doesn't change the game really in any way. It adds two new factions. And that's about it. And really, that's kind of nice not to have to relearn the game. You just get playing, same way as always, with just the two little additions uh, to the units. Side the expansion allows you to play with up to seven players. Now that's a lot. And we're going to do the exact opposite and play with only two. Playing with two players is called playing against the automata, the automatic player. This yellow team is going to be the automata for me. And I'm going to be playing the purple team, Team Togawa. So that's one of the new expansion races. And first you have to pick a difficulty level. I'm going to be picking normal. There is easy, hard, and ultra. I have not beaten the hard level yet and I've tried three times and it's very annoying but I think I can get them eventually. We're gonna be playing with normal and on the normal card it tells you how the enemy can move as it plays. Get into that in a minute. The setup for the automata is fairly simple, almost exactly follows the normal setup. Uh, its popularity gets set to 10, and the 10 popularity never changes. No matter what happens in the game, it'll always be 10. Don't touch it. It does get a normal amount of power, it gets a normal amount of starting power cards, gets a fixed amount of money, ignore the mat. It also doesn't get a normal action mat. It doesn't take actions like that. It uh, gets all of its units on its mat and two of its little guys on the field. It doesn't play with buildings at all, so you're never going to see an automatic building a building. Lucky for you, that means it doesn't get any scoring for buildings, but that does mean it's doing better than you overall, so you're kind of handicapped in that respect. We are going to be the purple team. Purple Team has very nice modern looking mechs compared to the old rickety mechs that we had before. This little plow mech, which has a giant wheel. I was little, when I first got signed, I was wondering, what is this? This doesn't look like a modern mech. These look like modern mechs. So we're going to be playing this tribe and she's going to be wandering off in the corner here. Now the game runs basically like a normal game. You take your turn, you know, let's say move. Move my guy, move my guy, and then I'm going to draw an automata card, which tells me how the automata takes their turn. So the first row tells you how they move. In this case, we've got a little worker is going to move. The worker movement takes a little bit of getting used to. Actually, all the movement takes a little bit of getting used to, and I'll get into that in a moment. Worker moves, and then the next row tells you what the automata gains. In this case, the automata gains a worker, goes on their home base, 
and also get the money. They never spend their money, unfortunately, so that's just points they're accruing over time. The last row tells you if you get any of your enlistment bonuses, which I haven't enlisted anyone, so unfortunately I don't get that. And the very last bit is a star or no star. So 90% of the cars have a star, so that means advance the little box on the token track. The more that gets progressed, the more closer you are to the end of the game. Discard the card, keep it face up so you can see it, because it will tell you for instance, if I kill anyone of his guys, not his workers, but his attack units, this turn I'll get two resources. Unfortunately, I'm nowhere near doing that. Now, when I first looked at these Automata track cards, I had no clue what this was. I thought it was sort of an ESP test. It's got the wiggly lines, and it's got the stars, like, I see a box. And when the rules sort of identified it as putting a cube on the first position in the track. Oh, okay. It's like snakes and ladders in reverse. So you're putting it at the beginning and every star you move it along. When it gets to the end, you're done. Or really when he gets uh, six stars, you're done. The little blue wavy lines indicate when they can cross rivers. Just like you can cross rivers if you hire the right mech, they can cross rivers when they run out of those blue wiggly lines with the X through it. So that's that. When you get to the two space, little thing that says Act 2, not only does the Automata get a star, that's their first star, you then have to take the Automata deck, flip it over to Act 2, and thereafter you're drawing and reading the red side of their action. So try to get as much as you can done before that happens because they really start ramping up their actions after that. Now as the Togawa, when I move, I can place one of my traps. So I'm going to place a trap here. I don't know what that trap is, but the trap does two things. If an enemy moves onto it, it activates it and hurts them. But also, one of my mech abilities allows me to move my character or mech to the trap, any of the traps on the board. So they also act as tunnels for me, just like the green player Albion. He can also move to his flags. And now you continue playing again and again and again. Take your turn, draw an automatic card, do whatever it says, then take your turn again, draw an automatic card, take your turn again, draw an automatic card, until you or the automatic finishes the game. However, one of the difficult parts about this automata is the movement. The movement is the single most complicated part of playing the automata, and it does take a bit of learning in the rulebook, and I had to pretty much constantly reconsult the rules every time. It does help that they give you all these little rule cards in addition to the manual, so you can just lay out the ones that you're having trouble with, I'm going to take the movement ones and just lay them down beside you, nice easy to reference places, so that you can always quickly refer to again, like, oh, how do the workers move again, because I can't really remember that. To move a worker, you're going to grab the worker that's closest to the home base, that is the home base if there is any on it, and then pick it up, because you don't want to have it affect your accounts that you're about to do. Find one of the neighborhood regions that's around your guys, that's all of these, and you're going to want to count how many of your own units are adjacent. So let's see. Up here, first one, there's one guy. This one, two guys. This one, two guys. That one, one guy. This one, one, two, three, three guys. This one, one, two, three, four, five. Oh my. Well, this one is the best. It's got five guys. It is a lake though. So is that a problem? Not for the automata. Nobody programmed it to not avoid water. So it's going to go in the water and it's going to stand there and it takes that spot. Also, it cannot move to a location that has another worker. It can move to a location that has a dude, but that has a worker already, can't go there. It could theoretically go here, that's one, two, three, four, but this one is five. If it were to have this as an option, it would not be able to choose this spot because there is an enemy right beside it. The worker will not move to his place that's next to an enemy. So it does avoid enemies. If that wasn't there, it could move here because it does like other workers, they're friendly, you know, they like to trade stories, but it will not go adjacent to the enemy unit. To move a mech, what we're going to do is take the mech closest to the home base, again, it always is the one closest to the home base for any move action. Uh, in this case, there's two uh, closest to the home base, so which one do we take? We follow the reading order rule, so we go from left to right, top to bottom. It's going to be this guy because he's hit first before this one. So this one's going to move. He's going to move to some neighboring area, and it has to be the shortest distance to an, another plastic guy he could attack. So he can attack the character or the mech. So let's say if he goes here, he's one, two spaces away. This one, 
Ooh, he's right beside him. So this one is the best choice because he can attack that guy closest in the future. So he's going to go there. That's in the neighborhood of his own units. He can attack him. He doesn't. Uh, but that's where he goes. To move the character, just grab the character and then move it. Just like the mech, it goes closest to an enemy attack unit. In this case, we have a character and a mech. So it could go here, could go here. It has to be in the neighborhood of one of your own units. Uh, it could go here. If there is a tie, because there is a tie here, that's close, that's right, adjacent. Uh, this is also adjacent. You go in reading order, but above reading order, there's another priority rule, is to go to the factory. So factory is the most attractive location. It goes to the factory, and when you go to the factory, the automatic gets the factory card. That's bad, because then you, you don't get the factory card, and you can't choose from it, so you lose it. You were too slow. In all my games, I was way too slow, and I lost that factory card. The encounter card is a little bit interesting. It is what allows the character to get to the factory eventually, but it also gets the character to the various encounter tokens. So to do this, we take the character and we're going to be targeting either the factory or one of the encounter tokens that haven't been claimed yet. Uh, we do have to basically not have a factory card if we're going to be targeting the factory. Let's assume we don't have it yet. So we're going to be looking priority order. We want to get to the factory more importantly than the counter marker. So can we get to the factory in a neighborhood of one of our units? No, we don't have anything close enough to it. So we do have a token here, a token here, uh, around any of these. No, but we do have one here close to the worker. Now the requirement is the character cannot move to a location that has a Mac. So even though these are in higher priority order for the reading order, because we have a three-way tie, that would be the first one in reading order. But it has a mech. Can't go there. And can't go there. So following reading order and that rule, that puts us here. When you land on a space with a token, you just throw it away. You don't use the encounter cards, you just toss it. So nobody can get that. Now, something to be aware of, if you were playing as the Tagawa or the Albion characters, when they do that same action, they can also place a trap marker down if it's legal, or a flag if it's legal. If, however, the Togawa, an additional rule for the Togawa, if she's moving around and there happens to be a disarmed trap marker, she can also target the disarmed trap marker, move to it, and rearm it. And that's her special ability. There are two types of attacks. The first type of attack is attacking a worker. That's the most cowardly and disgraceful attack in the game. That is where the Automata, again, takes its closest unit to the base and jumps it onto some workers that are undefended. So in this case, and it has to be in a neighborhood of your unit. So that's these guys. So we've got workers here, here, and here. Now these guys are defended by a dude. They do have a lot of uh, worker resources, but unfortunately we're not going to be able to go there because there's already a guy there. These guys totally undefended, but these guys have more resources. The priority order for choosing is the one with the most resources. So I'm sorry guys, you guys go home and your resources, what happens to them? They're destroyed. Your resources just go away. There's no way to reclaim them. It is very disappointing. Now to do the more damaging kind of attack, which is a mech attack, is going to be a little bit different. It has a number in front of the attack, which means the automata must have that much power to do the attack. If it doesn't, skip to the next attack type or movement type or whatever and do that instead. Now in this case, let's assume we do have the power. So we're going to pick the attack unit that's closest to the home base. That's a mech or a character. In this case, it's a character. So we're going to take the character, pick it up, choose the location in the neighborhood of our units. That's these guys and these guys that has the fewest uh, combat units. And this is the fewest. There's two units here, but one is a worker, not a combat unit. So he's going to go there and attack. And then you follow the normal attack rules at that point. The automata is nothing if not cowardly. Now let's assume that you've attacked the automata or the automata has attacked you. Both very unfortunate things to occur. The card here is the current turn card. And that's the most recent one that you've finished and played. It's basically from last turn. The amount of resources here is how many you'll be getting if you defeat him. Let's try to do that. The resources are based on the tile that you're attacking on. I'm going to be playing four power against him with one of my cards, a number four. So that'll give me eight attack power. Eight attack power. Hopefully that is good enough. 
You choose your power first before looking at the results. The results are here in the next combat card. Flip it over. This card only applies for the bottom here. Ignore all this. So we're just going to look at the bottom. The uh, automata. The automata only has 8 attack power. Uh, that puts him in the middle of the range, 8 to 13, which gives him a 5 attack power. 5. Good, I'm beating him. I have 8. Oh, except he's going to be drawing 2 random cards. You don't look at his cards, ever. So he just draws 2 random ones. Let's hope they're terrible. Oh, we got 2 and a 2. 5 and two, 4, 9. Well, I just lost by 1. So I don't get resources, and he wins. That's what I like about Automata. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know how much you're going to have to spend to win. Hmm. Something to be aware of for the Automata. There is ways for the Automata to get stars in addition to that star track. So when it passes a star on the star track, including the one that has a little two on it, I didn't notice the star under there the first time I looked at it, but it's there. There are six stars on that track. It can also earn stars a couple other ways. This track here that you're looking at, the way you get stars, it generally ignores. It can't achieve most of these things. It can achieve the maximum power uh, goal. So if it does achieve that one time, the first time, it will get a star for that. However, if it beats you in combat, it can get up to two stars for that. Those are the three stars that it can achieve on this track. So try not to let it beat you in combat or get all of its power. All the other stars just get placed beside the track as it achieves them. Don't let it get six before you. You don't really want that to happen. Now the Automata doesn't get an action board. It does get a player mat like this to identify which faction it is, but you don't really use it very much. None of the special abilities apply, none of the mech abilities apply, and really the only thing it's good for is holding the stars, holding the workers, and holding the mechs when they get killed. They go back onto the mat, not the home base. Should you get the expansion to Scythe, Invaders from Afar? I would say so. When I got the base game, I was wondering, why are these guys not in the game? There's things for them on the map. Where are my guys? So, really it just adds two new units, two new factions, and doesn't really change the complexity level of the game. They do play a little bit different with their flags and their traps, but even the flags and traps actually behave quite similarly to each other. You can both move to them. They both count as controlling the area. Can't place them in place of buildings. So not much more to understand compared to other expansions of other games where you do have to read a whole new manual. This one just has a tiny little addendum, tiny baby manual. You could almost play it without reading the manual, to be honest. The information is on the sheet here. And yeah, it just increases your options. And you get these nice 50 monies, which is great because you're going to be earning a lot more money with this game because you'll be playing more and enjoying it more. So until next time, see ya. The best thing about playing Automata is that you don't have to play with people that don't know what they're doing. That's why you're losing against the computer. You just learn to play. Just attack the guys. Don't be so afraid of losing popularity. My cold dark heart doesn't care if the workers are sent home. My stampy featured mechs will smush them and I will have all of their wonderful little wheat. They don't produce wheat. That's not useful. Why don't they produce stuff I can steal? This automata player is lazy. If you like this video, wait, there's a squirrel. That squirrel really doesn't like me being there. Ah, <laughs> do squirrels attack people? Anyways, like and subscribe before I get bitten by this thing. Okay, it's gone. Goodbye, squirrel. Goodbye. See ya.